So, I guess we'll just go in order of legions, actually. So, first of all, we've got the Dark Angels. Now, the Dark Angels are particularly highlighted. Well, the Dark Angels can be told apart from other chapters because of their predominantly dark green armor with a little bit of bright red. Now, the Dark Angels are led by Primarch Lionel Johnson, uh, which I think is a super cool name, and he looks super cool. He was considered one of the best swordsmen out of all the Primarchs, which is quite the praise right there. Now, Lionel Johnson, uh, at this point in time, he... The Dark Angels went through their own kind of, I guess you could say, kind of mini Horus Heresy of their own. Uh, they were, they had uh, this uh, second in command known as Luther. Uh, now, Luther ended up leading quite a few Dark Angels into the into, uh, like, uh, against the main Dark Angels. And during this battle, uh, Lionel Johnson got struck down by his second-in-command, Luther. Uh, and so, but, uh, he was overcome with guilt for his actions, and in anger for kind of another... Uh, I guess kind of loss, the Chaos Gods just launched all of the Dark Angels that fell against uh, against each other across the warp, across the galaxy. Now, the Dark Angels that uh, turned to Luther's side and betrayed the Imperium are known as the Fallen Angels. And this is actually quite important to what the Dark Angels are all about. First of all, I feel as though the Dark Angels are, like, one of the coolest looking Space Marine chapters out there. Because it's like, they kind of have this uh, medieval knight aesthetic. And actually, a lot of their special uh, war gear are stuff like, you know, like special swords and shields and all of that kind of stuff. They look like knights, like actual proper knights, which I think is really cool. I like, I really like the aesthetic, especially when you combine it with dark green. Now, the thing with the Dark Angels is that they are a very secretive chapter. They are very particular with their plans. They don't really uh, like to tell uh, their fellow Space Marine chapters about their plans very often. In fact, they're so secretive that they have this group known as the Inner Circle. And the Inner Circle are the ones that are in charge of essentially all the Dark Angels affairs. Planning, strategizing, as well as their main mission. They, the Dark Angels have a very secret mission. Remember those Fallen Angels that I was talking about before? Yeah. So, the Fallen Angels are considered to be a bit of a blight on the Dark Angels' history. And as far as they're concerned, they're not going to be forgiven by the Emperor for until they... Uh, find every single fallen angel in the galaxy and offer them penance by essentially uh, allow by essentially getting them to repent or by just killing them which I think is probably the easier option uh, oh I forgot to tell you so you remember when I was saying that Lionel Johnson was struck down by his second-in-command? Well, 
there's actually a secret that is known possibly only to the Emperor himself that Lionel Johnson is actually still alive and is currently in stasis within the Dark Angel's main base of operations known as the Rock. And there will come a time when Lionel Johnson will be resurrected essentially and be able to lead the Dark Angels once again. So, yeah. But for now, Lionel Johnson is completely out of action. But there is the prophecy that he will return. Um, so what are the Dark Angels all about? Uh, they are considered to be quite elite uh, soldiers. Uh, but they don't seem to be particularly exceptional in any one category. They're kind of really good at everything but not uh, exceptional at anything. So I guess you could kind of say that they're kind of generalist. Uh, however, the fact that they're having this constant shadow war with the fallen angels, or simply the fallen, means that they are very good at secrecy. <laughs> they can keep secrets extremely well, um, even to the point where the Inquisition gets confused by their skullduggery and for those who don't know the Inquisition is basically like the Imperium secret police so they're even able to confuse the secret police with their secrecy they can out secret their own secret police imagine that um, however this secrecy is kind of a, a, a double-edged sword Pretty similar to Batman, actually. Much like Batman, actually. The Dark Angel's secrecy has led to a lot of chapters, a lot of their fellow Space Marine chapters, not really trusting them most of the time. In fact, they've even killed Imperial subjects that are supposed to be on their side in order to keep their secrets. It's, uh... Yeah, it's a bit of an awkward time. Not only that, but the Fallen have actually sometimes been going about in the galaxy pretending to be Dark Angels, like Loyalist Dark <gasps> Angels. Which has made them even less trustworthy. So, yeah. The Dark Angels are really good at keeping secrets, like really good at it. Um, however, much like Batman, this secrecy means that uh, a lot of people don't trust them. In fact, sometimes the Dark Angels have just full on abandoned their allies in order to pursue uh, their own goals that are unknown to anybody. So yeah. Now that I think about it, if Batman was in the Warhammer 40k universe, I feel as though he would actually get along really well with the Dark Angels. <laughs> they seem to be his type of people. Oh, and also actually, uh, bringing up the Emperor, I forgot to mention something uh, about the Imperium. So obviously you're in a sci-fi world, science fantasy world, you've got huge amounts of space to travel so obviously you need to have some explanation for why you're able to travel multiple light years in like seconds and what the Imperium does is they actually use the warp to travel intergalactically see as I mentioned with the warp it is pretty much completely incomprehensible to your average person um, but psychers uh, can sometimes uh, kind of act as like I, I guess almost like a like a beacon or a lighthouse uh, to get to the and other side of the warp that you want to get to, uh, and that's why the warp can be so dangerous because if you don't have a psyker 
in your in your group, you're basically just going to get lost in the warp forever, which sucks. Now, the Emperor, being the most powerful psyker in the galaxy, uh, is essentially used as a kind of the biggest lighthouse ever in order to help the Imperium travel across the warp. Now, in order to do that, they need to keep his life support system online. In order to do that, they have to sacrifice trillions of souls every single day in order to keep the Emperor alive. And if the Emperor died at any point, the Imperium would no longer be able to travel through the warp. And they would basically be stuck within their galaxies. It would, it would be a pretty dark day for the Imperium. So, yeah, not, not the best of times. Possibly the worst of times, even. I know, can you believe it? Uh, so yeah, anyway, that was the Dark Angels. Now, we're going to move to the next one. So, the Dark Angels are the first chapter, like the... Like, Chapter 1. They're the very first one. Now, the next Loyalist faction is the fifth chapter, The White Scars, led by Jagatai Khan. And, uh... Best way to think about him is, uh... He, he's kind of... Oh, I feel as though they're actually inspired by the Mongols quite a bit, as I will explain soon. So... Jagadai Khan was, um, he was actually probably one of the most, one of the, probably the wisest and the most reasonable Primarch out of all of them. He was very wise and, uh, he had something that was pretty sorely lacking in the 40k universe and, uh, that was, that was common sense. Uh, in fact, uh, the Khan was the only one of the Primarchs, one of the only Loyalist Primarch that actually was willing to hear out uh, their Chaos Brothers. Obviously, he listened to them and still chose the side of the Emperor, but the fact that he was willing to hear them out at all is better than any of his Loyalist Brothers on it. So yeah, Jagadai Khan's a pretty cool guy. He's a pretty chill guy. Um, however, there was a battle. However, uh, there was a point where he was traveling uh, through the warp. I think. Uh, I think in pursuit of some Eldar. Uh, when suddenly the connection with the warp or the webway, rather, um, which is essentially the Eldar's form of international travel, it international intergalactic travel. Mr. Worldwide, going international, international, yeah, no, intergalactic travel, the, the Eldar's intergalactic travel is called the Webway, and the Khan was travelling through that until eventually the connection with the Webway was severed, and the Khan ended up getting stuck in the Webway, so he's right now stuck in another dimension, uh, so yeah, that's where that's where the Khan is right now, and uh, he is the leader of, as I'd said before, the fifth Space Marine chapter, the White Scars. Now, what are the White Scars all about? Well, they are, as I'd said, they're very much like the Mongols in real life. They're all about speed and lightning strikes. Um, they essentially are all about mounted cavalry um, and it's not exactly uncommon uh, for whole armies to just go into battle on like a mount of some kind uh, possibly on assault bikes or on rhinos which are like uh, they're kind of like tanks they're, they're like one of the tanks for the Imperium but the rhino but a rhino is more about like carrying troops. Oh, oh, Farad! I forgot to I forgot to say, um, 
white scars are like they're defined by having their predominantly white armor as the name would suggest uh, with a little bit of red a little bit of red in it as well um, yeah so that's their color scheme pretty much uh, m like almost exclusively white with like a little bit of red as their name would suggest so yeah it's not uncommon for them to all go in on vehicles of some kind um, their usual tactics are all about hit and run tactics um, just gradually whittling their army down until they become weak enough that they can get knocked over by like a huge force from the white scars um, pretty pretty effective tactic right there outstanding move um, also, the Legion's combat doctrine dictates that they essentially have to they have to overwhelm the enemy army uh, in their final attack, uh, which is why usually the army gets held back uh, for the most part. Like they'll they'll keep their main force back until they're pretty certain that like just one massive wave will be enough to take him out. It's rather precise, actually. It's basically, we're gonna, like, slowly weaken the forces until they're weak enough for our whole army to take him out. Um, and, obviously, they have had centuries to perfect that strategy, so they're very good at it. Uh, extremely savage. Although, such assaults often lead to the enemy just, you know, running away or getting demoralized. Especially if this battle, if this tactic prolongs for weeks on end by just small skirmishes, the White Scars do lack dedicated fire support. Uh, they don't really have many Dreadnoughts in their chapter, for those who don't know. Dreadnoughts are basically these, like, giant, uh, battle robots, essentially. Giant, these massive battle mechs that are about as big as a room, that have a space marine, uh, a space marine soul inside them. Uh, yeah, they don't have many dread. Dreadnoughts are very powerful, they can take a lot of punishment, and they can deal a lot of punishment. The White Scars don't have a lot of these guys, which is kind of unfortunate because Dreadnoughts are extremely useful. Devastators, they don't have a lot either. Uh, sieges are, like, terrible for them. It's like they're Kryptonite. And, um, despite the fact that I had said that skirmishes can go on for weeks, prolonged battles can, um... Well, they, they don't usually go well for them. Uh, it's often best for the enemy to attack the White Scars before they feel ready uh, to attack with their final wave. So, yeah, obviously being... Essentially being more even more aggressive than the White Scars themselves can be quite effective for them. Uh, and it is possible to capitalize on their lack of reserves if they do attack. Uh, although, obviously, you're still going to be dealing with space marines. So, it's only as easy as that's going to be. Uh, not only that, but there is also a minor flaw in their gene seed. Uh, for the record, gene seeds are basically... Gene seeds are pretty much the whole... like. They're kind of like the specific genetic makeup that makes uh, a Primark. And essentially, all Space Marines are based off of this Gene Seed. They get the Gene Seed from their Primark, which is why you can say that a Space... that say, a Space Marine White Scar is going to be somewhat related to the Khan. Or a Dark Angel Space Marine is going to be somewhat related to the Lion. 
you know, stuff like that. And if there is a flaw in the gene seed, then that can cause problems for the entire chapter, which I'll get into later on for another chapter. But for the white scars, there is a minor flaw uh, that makes them more prone to acts of savagery. Uh, which led to this event known as the Red Highway Massacre. And intertribal rivalry does occasionally flare up between the white scars from different tribes. Uh, so yeah, they are kind of more prone to savagery than the average space marine is. However, this is kind of a minor flaw. So yeah, very much like the Mongols. They're all about mounted offenses, they're all about hit and run tactics and then just overwhelming them when they're weak enough, but if you manage to catch them before they're ready, then that's a pretty reliable tactic against them. Uh, next up, we have the sixth Space Marine chapter, the Space Wolves, currently led by Lehman Roots. Now, Lehman Roos, I believe, is considered to be one of the more, one of the most powerful Primarchs out of all of them. He is exceptionally good at close quarters combat, and this is reflected within the Space Wolves chapter. The Space Wolves are primarily shown by the fact that, well, their main color scheme involves, like, a very light blue silverish armor with some yellow in there as well uh, and on top of the fact that they are very uh, they're very wolf bound uh, <laughs> they are very wolf themed as you could imagine now Lehman Roos is a uh, well Lehman Roos uh, is currently uh, in this, uh, this basically like this huge black hole of chaos known as the Eye of Terror. Um, he's been going on a rampage in the Eye of Terror, just killing chaos forces left, right, and center all over the place. All over the place. And, uh,. Yeah, they're pretty, um, mm. yeah, yeah, so he's just been going on his own personal mission, just destroying a bunch of chaos within the Eye of Terror, and he has kind of left the, uh, the Space Wolves on their own. Now, the Space Wolves are quite well renowned for being very anti-authoritarian. These guys are kind of like Vikings, actually. If you think about it, they're like space vikings that are wolf themed. It's actually really cool. I really like the space wolves. Um, they're really cool. The um, but they're also uh, renowned. Well, they they embrace the the savage barbarian culture of their home planet, and they uh, they uh, deviate from the main battle doctrine of the Space Marines quite a bit. These guys are kind of the outsiders of the... They're kind of the outsiders of the Space Marines, uh, but they're really cool. Really cool. Uh, the Space Wolves themselves are essentially... They're, they're berserkers. Like, they're pretty much all berserkers. Um, much like their Primarch, Lehman Roos, they have mastered the art of brutal CQC, brutal close combat, um, without, without being too dedicated to it. Uh, so they can still do long range tactics. So they're not, they're not reliant on close quarters, basically. Uh, there's also a few hints that they are specialized in interlegion warfare. Uh, if you believe that um, they're the reason why we know nothing about the second or eleventh legions, there's a theory 
that uh, the reason why we know nothing about the 2nd and 11th Space Marine Legions is because of the Space Wolves. They did something about that. And if that's the case, it would mean that they're extremely good at dealing with other Space Marine Legions and getting away with it. Uh, however, they do, they are burdened with a curse. Um, it is known as the Wolfen Curse, and if you're wondering what the whole deal with Wolfen is, uh, is that essentially, uh, how can I put this? If a space wolf kind of embraces their savagery too much, they will turn into a Wolfen which are essentially these werewolf-esque creatures um, that are extremely brutal and extremely savage. Um, yeah. It does, it does kind of suck for them. And their wolfen curse uh, not only attracts the attention of the Inquisition quite a bit because they're like, hmm, this smells suspiciously like heresy. Uh, but they also, but it also makes sure uh, that there are not a lot of space wolves in the Imperium. I believe there's only actually one space marine, well, one space wolf successive chapter. So, like, you know, you have the first founding marine chapters, the second foundings. These are the, uh, they're kind of successor chapters that were kind of, uh, based on one of the first founding ones. The Space Wolves only have one successive chapter, which crumbled very quickly due to a lot of their soldiers becoming Wolfen. Uh, however, their greatest weakness is probably the fact that they're kind of just too good at s as soldiers. Um, they more or less can't do anything other than warfare. They can be compassionate towards allies and fellow warriors, um, but they are basically just weapons that are only really interested in warfare. Uh, more so than any other Space Marine uh, chapter. Which is kind of sad. I will admit. It's, yeah. It's essentially the idea that if peacetime comes, they will have nothing to do. And I believe I once heard a, the uh, a quote that... Um, the heroes in wartime often become the uh, villains in peacetime because the yeah the idea is if the Imperium were to ever undergo peace, they probably would be the ones causing the most problems, which sucks. Then you have the Iron Fist. No, that's a Marvel character. I meant to say the Imperial Fists. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the Imperial Fists probably have my favorite color scheme because their armor is mostly yellow. It's primarily yellow with a little bit of red and a little bit of white, I think, but it's mostly yellow. If you're going with just one color to describe the Space Marine chapters, Dark Angels would be dark green, White Scars would be white, Space Wolves would be like a bluey, silvery type of color, Imperial Fists are yellow. I think that's kind of the nicest color, if I'm being honest. And the Imperial Fists are led by Rogaldorn. Rogaldorn was originally kind of the dude in charge of running the Space Marine army during the Horus Heresy. However, sometime after the Horus Heresy, he was battling a... He was in a battle against uh, the Dark Eldar, uh, another one of the factions that I'll talk about later. And eventually, they 
were only able to recover his hand. They only found his hand. So, Rogaldorn is kind of presumed dead, but like, truth be told, as we know with fiction, if you don't see a corpse, uh, then there's really no guarantee that they're dead. And sometimes even if you do see their corpse, it might be a fake out. So, far as I'm concerned, the fact that they only found a hand means that either uh, he was completely destroyed to the, p to the point where only one of his hands remained, or he lost his hand in battle, and he's still alive, but just unarmed. Heh <laughs> heh. funny. So, yeah, we don't know where Rogaldorn is. It's kind of reasonable to presume that he is dead or alive either way. Now, although the Imperial Fists are low in numbers, they are absolute masters of defensive warfare. Even to the point where they have been chosen as the defenders of the solar system, like uh, our solar system right now, and Holy Terra itself, which is obviously Earth. They have been chosen as the primary guardians of the main Imperial Solar System. Uh, which should tell you just how good these guys are at defensive warfare. They are stubborn as a mule and extremely stoic. They will pretty much never give any ground to their enemy. Uh, they believe in sacrifice without limit. They essentially will either drive their foe off, completely annihilate them, or be completely annihilated themselves. Surrender is not an option for these guys. They shall not pass. And, uh, despite that, that is actually their greatest strength and weakness. Although they are pretty much an immovable object when it comes to defense, they're not particularly great, uh, on the offense. And their stubborn nature, uh, obviously, as I'd said before, means that retreating is not an option for them. They're kind of like Spartans that way. You know, either come back home with your shield or on top of it. And this means that uh, they have a very high casualty rate. Hence why they have such low numbers. That being said, they're also probably the loyalist of the loyalist legions. They're probably the most loyal out of all of them. They are renowned for their loyalty and reliability. They maintain good relations with the other branches of the Imperium's military, and I'd say that the Imperial Fists probably have the fewest numbers of Marines that have fallen to chaos. However, they also suffer from a bit of a genetic curse, known as Death Before Dishonor, which I feel you could probably figure out what this all means. Although the severity varies uh, from marine to marine, those who are afflicted by this curse exhibit very abnormal behavior, which can range from simple obtrusiveness and stubbornness in the face of the enemy, to overzealous self-castigation and even feelings of inadequacy, believing that uh, they have they've essentially let down the expectations of their Primarch Rogaldorn. So yeah, it seems like it's a bit of a mental health problem for them, which sucks for them. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, the Imperial Fists are the seventh legion, so we've got the first, the fifth, sixth, and seventh so far. So, which one is next? The ninth. Space Marines chapter, known as the Blood Angels. 
That's right, so we've got the Dark Angels and the Blood Angels. So, what is the deal with the Blood Angels? Uh, well, the Blood Angels are led by the Primarch known as Sanguinius, uh, who I'd always pronounced as Sanguinus, but, uh, the fact that everyone says Sanguinius means that I feel as though it's more likely that they are correct. It's probably more likely that I am wrong, rather than, like, everybody else is wrong. So yeah, Sanguinius, uh, who's often referred to as, uh, an angel, uh, during the times of the Great Crusade. Um, so where is Sanguinius right now? Well, he's dead. <laughs> he's actually one of the few Primarchs that are actually confirmed dead. And in fact, his death was like the second last thing that happened in the Horus Heresy before it ended. So, what happened towards the end of the Horus Heresy was that Sanguinius ended up confronting his battle brother Horus, who at that point had become a lot more powerful due to a lot of boons from Chaos and all that. Uh, that, combined with the fact that Sanguinius didn't really want to hurt his battle brother, led to Horus killing Sanguinius in the battle. And Sanguinius's death led the Emperor to fall into immense grief and led him to kill Horus um, and destroy him completely out of that grief. So yeah, Sanguinius is a pretty significant character, but he is dead. He is confirmed dead. And the Blood Angels kind of haven't really been able to recover from their Primarch's death. Although they are specialized in melee warfare, kind of like the Space Wolves, they do... they are still very skilled in plenty of... in, like, all other areas. Um, it may sound odd, but these guys are probably the closest thing to the whole demigod status that the Space Marines had achieved. Um, they had... They have this angelic appearance, which, by the way, is uh, highlighted by their armor being primarily bright red, as the name Blood Angels would probably give you the idea of. And they can inspire the common man and woman to performing great deeds. They are very inspirational as soldiers and have been described fighting alongside mortal soldiers uh, when the latter would have long ago broken and fled. They bring a great amount of inspiration to those planets that they come to. However, they do have a pretty big weakness. Um, they have two curses, actually, uh, as opposed to just one. Uh, they are known as the Red Thirst and the Black Rage. So, uh, Red Thirst is, um, it, it's, it basically gives a Blood Angel a vampiric craving for blood. Um, they essentially just crave blood. Very much like a vampire. Uh... <laughs> Yeah. Um, the Blood Angels generally already have pale skin, moderately elongated eye teeth, and a strong urge to drink the blood of their enemies, uh, which can grow stronger and stronger over decades of their service, eventually causing degeneration into uncontrollable madness. Yeah, so they are kind of obsessed with, uh, they, they can become huge cravers for blood. Um, and now the thing is, 
Well, actually, I might as well explain the next one first. Black Rage uh, is this uh, mental instability. It's also called the Flaw of Sanguinius. Um, because it was actually caused by Sanguinius's death. It left a psychic imprint. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, so, Blood Angels are unique amongst the Space... I'm reading off the wiki right now. They're unique amongst the Space Marines in that deeply ingrained in their gene seed is the encoded experience of their Primarch. And most deeply imprinted of all is the memory of Sanguinius's final battle with Horus. So it seems as though every single Blood Angel has this memory of Sanguinius's final battle, as though they were actually there. Sometimes, on the eve of battle, an event or circumstance will trigger this genetic memory, and the Battle Brother's mind is suddenly wrenched into the distant past. The Black Rage overcomes the Blood Angel as the memories and consciousness of Sanguinius intrude upon his mind, and dire events 10,000 Terran years old flood into the present. The Black Rage overcomes the Blood Angel as the memories and consciousness of Sanguinius intrude upon his mind, and dire events 10,000 Terran years old flood into the present. This can cause Blood Angel Astartes to go insane prior to or during the battle and feel the uncontrollable rage of Sanguinius himself during the final days of the Siege of Terror. This curse is largely irrecoverable. Ir ir irre irre irrecoverable. And only a few blood angels have ever been able to fix it. So, for the record, um, the red thirst can be cured uh, with like a priest or something like that, or a chaplain, maybe. Um, but the Black Rage cannot, and it seems like only a few people have ever been able to, uh, cure themselves from it. Now, obviously, this curse can cause a lot of problems. It can also very quickly alienate allies if these curses aren't kept in hand, and it sometimes results in, uh, supposed comrades just getting absolutely massacred by the Blood Angels. Completely massacred. And obviously they have a... they have a... a search for a cure. Um, this, this search for a cure can make them quite predictable, as this was the case with the Blood Drinkers. Uh, an entire successor chapter that ended up unknowingly turning to chaos in the end. So, yeah. The Blood Angels kind of have a bit of a sad time a lot of the time. They have a lot of vices that they've got to deal with over their time. It really does suck for them. Uh, next up, we have the Iron Hands, the 10th Space Marine chapter, uh, led by the uh, Primarch known as Ferris Manus. Now, the Iron Hands. Now, I, w I wanna, I wanna ask you a question. You, you imagine in a Space Marine chapter called the Iron Hands. What color scheme are you imagining? Probably thinking like gray, silver, maybe black a little bit. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Their color scheme is mostly black with like a bit of silver gray type of stuff going on as well. Um, and a lot of gear motifs. <laughs> um, yeah, Ferris Manus was, uh, he was a pretty brainy guy. He was very good with technology. Um, I feel, I think he got along with uh, a particular cult of the machine that we might want to talk about later on. 
So, where is Ferris Manus right now? Well, he's also dead. <laughs> um, yeah, Ferris Manus, uh, during the events of the Horus Heresy, uh, he got just straight up decapitated by his own brother, Fulgrim, who I'll get into later. Remember that name, Fulgrim. I'll bring him up later. Later on. And Ferris Manus was actually the very first Primarch to ever die in battle. And it kind of showed that um, essentially the only thing that can really kill a Primarch is another Primarch. It seems. Or the Emperor himself. Because that also happened. So yeah, poor Ferris. Uh, he, he didn't deserve what he got, really. Um, so, obviously, yeah, these guys are all about tech. Um, and they can actually, they actually have some pretty cool models, I will admit. Um, obviously, a group that is all about technology and steam, gears, and cybernetics, um, it will often have forces comprised of heavy vehicles and weapons capable of a uh, very very heavy power heavy firepower um, such force is used with absolutely brutal efficiency as well uh, every single bullet and battle brother is expended with scientific precision belying their intense hatred and this is actually I think one of the big things with the iron hands they're kind of the brain trusts of the Space Marines. Uh, very s heavily strategized. While the main body confronts the enemy from the front, some mechanized units supported by heavy vehicles will sweep the flanks and then catch the enemy in a very tough to get out of crossfire. This is actually a tactic known as the Head of the Gorgon. Head of the Gorgon attack with main infantry from the front and then basically flank them with heavy heavy vehicles and mechanized units um, but the main strength that they have uh, isn't so much the heavy weapons or the crap ton of cybernetic enhancements that they have done to themselves but they're kind of perfectionists like, they have an absolutely bitter hatred uh, for any and all weakness. They are kind of huge perfectionists. Um, they're going to be pushing themselves just relentlessly, making them perfect themselves, making them the perfect enemy killer. And when confronted with those who have fallen to chaos, it is possible for that hatred to start bubbling up to the surface and they abandon their usual slow and methodical approach for a violent assault conducted entirely in silence. However, this, as you would expect, perfectionism, pushing themselves to better themselves, it's also their greatest weakness. That hatred is a manifestation of the fear that they regard themselves. They fear the weakness within their own body, and they fear that that weakness will betray them uh, in their greatest time of need. I can tell you firsthand, uh, I am more annoyed at this point when technology fails me when I need it the most. Like right now, I'm recording this on my desktop computer because my laptop is absolute garbage right now. But even the desktop computer, it's like, the mouse is wireless, but it keeps, like, just shutting off uh, every, like, 10 seconds, despite the fact that I have put a fresh battery in it. So I don't know about you Iron Hands guys, but I would probably be more concerned about technology failing you than your own body for now. <sighs> But uh, it seems like they disagree with me because their solution to the weakness in their body is by just slapping more cybernetics on it. Um, 
Now, this, this fatal flaw of the Iron Hands has kind of been a thing forever. Like, even before the Horus Heresy. But I feel as though Ferris Manus' death probably exacerbated that a little bit more. Um, considering that they have a lot of guilt over the fact that they were unable to save their Primarch. Although, to be fair, he was facing another Primarch, which is like... You know, how much can you guys do? I mean, I guess they rec they take the perspective of an anime protagonist and are like, I just wasn't strong enough. So when others suggest caution and prudence, the Iron Hand see weakness that's mirrored in themselves. And so they uh, really hate those that they consider weak or cautious. Any enemy that seeks to defeat the Iron Hands must take this psychological flaw into account, which would be pretty easy to do. Um, because, yeah, perfectionism, just a heads up, guys, perfectionism is not a good thing. Um, it, it eats you alive. Uh, not to mention, okay, here's another thing about the Iron Hands. Um, any battle that they enter... Uh, is required to undergo the Calculum Rationale, which is essentially the the main the main people in charge of the Iron Hands, known as the Iron Council, are given all the data, all the information on the battle, um, uh, determine uh, the Iron Council then determines how much resources will be needed to win. And then they will dispatch the result. No more, no less. Like, total minimalism. They will only deploy whatever is enough to win. Um, and not a single extra. This means that any force of Iron Hands is logically all that's needed to defeat the enemy. But... Obviously, considering that you're basing your battle off of, like, data, basically, means that they can become extremely predictable and inflexible, because if a new variable comes in, they can't really adapt to that situation. Um, also, despite the fact that they're all about technology, they actually surprisingly do not have that many Dreadnoughts in their army, um, nor do they have many Terminator suits, which are basically like your super suits, better than normal power armor. Um, this obviously, well, I mean, there's, there's no th through no fault of their own, because um, an event called the Istvan V Massacre uh, robbed them of a lot of their treasured artifacts, including the, um, including, like, pretty much, well, uh, most of their Terminator and Dreadnought suits. Most of them. Yeah. Anyway, next up, we've got the Ultramarines. That's right, boys, we've gotten to the main the main boys here. Now, the Ultramarines are definitely the most popular and the most well-known Space Marines out of all of them. You know how I said that the Space Marines are like the poster children for uh, Space Mar for Warhammer? Well, these guys are the poster children for Space Marines themselves. So... <laughs> We're gonna be dealing with a lot of a lot of stuff with the Ultramarines. A lot of stuff is focused on these guys, so we might as well uh, start off with their color scheme. The Ultramarines are most well known for having dark blue armor, as well as a little bit of gold as a secondary color, as well. Uh, their Primarch is uh, far out. <laughs> I don't know how his name is meant to be pronounced, I've only ever heard it be said as a meme, 
I'm going to say Robote. I think it's actually meant to be pronounced Robote Gilliman, but like I've I've just been saying Roboat so many times. I'm just gonna call him Roboat. The the meme name is Roboat Girly Man. Uh, for now, I think I'll just call him Roboat Gilliman. So Roboat Gilliman, obviously, as I'd said, the 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 the. <laughs> The Primarch of the Ultramarines chapter. The Ultramarines being the uh, the 13th chapter of the Space Marines. Um, Robot Gilliman was... Uh, he was kind of... The thing with him was he was very good at... Um, uh, I guess like... Main maintaining an army. So, like, he wasn't particularly great at, like, combat or anything. Like, obviously, this is just by Primarch standards. He would still be able to probably decimate his entire chapter by himself without any trouble. But compared to other Primarchs, he was kind of mid-league as, as combat proficiency goes. What he was very good at, though, was... Essentially, uh, lead, like, uh, leading, uh, an organization. He had expert organization skills, which really helped the Imperium later on. Because, after the events of the Horus Heresy, Robot Gilliman was going about, um, he was, he was fighting, um, he was fighting alongside his uh, fellow space marine, uh, ultramarine brothers, uh, until he ended up coming across uh, his brother Fulgrim. Um, yeah, the same one that killed uh, Ferris Manus. Um, Fulgrim at this point had become a lot more powerful uh, since the events of the Horus Heresy. Uh, to the point where he had now become what's called a demon primarch, which I will explain later on. But anyway, during the events of this battle, um, Gilliman battled his uh, demon primarch brother uh, and was ultimately mortally wounded by the battle, and he got sent into stasis. Uh, yay! Fun times! Um, so he was in stasis for a very long time, uh, since then. But then, um, but then, But then, eventually, he was able to actually come out of stasis, and he came back, and he took place as basically, like, uh, I think it was, like, Force Commander of the Imperium. He's essentially the guy in charge of the whole Imperium now. And he's going about, um... And he's essentially leading the entire Imperium, making sure that they are well stocked for battle. This is basically the best thing that could have possibly happened to the Imperium, because as I'd said before, Gilliman is an absolute beast at organization. He was able to organize the entire Imperium so that it was able to operate much more efficient, much better than it had beforehand. And on top of that, he has a lot. Despite being a mid-league Primarch, a Primarch is still a Primarch, and he can still fight extremely well. He's basically invincible on the battlefield. He's great. Um, yeah. Gilliman, at this point, is actually the only Primarch that is currently not only still alive, uh, not on, but is also still in action, fighting for the Imperium, uh, in the material world. 
I am not counting Lehman Roos, who is currently in the Eye of Terror. Um, so yeah, that's actually great for the Space Marines. It gives the Imperium uh, a better chance at winning now. They, uh, yeah, they're, it's, it's really great for them. And I feel as though the fact that their Primarch is still around is uh, probably why they are the biggest Space Marine chapter out of all of them. They command the most amount of space, and they have the biggest numbers, as well as the best resources overall. They are proficient in all manners of warfare. They're kind of your jack-of-all-trades uh, chapter. They never specialize too much in one method. Lest, uh, lest they get worse in other aspects. So they try to make sure to keep things pretty generalist. Now, their greatest strength comes from their generalship. Um, obviously, Primarch Gilliman is a tactician without equal, uh, but they're also incredibly disciplined and always employ the most logical strategy without sacrificing their honor. Uh, I feel like this is why the Ultramarines can be kind of boring. You see them a lot. <laughs> you see them all the time. There are always Ultramarines going about. Uh, sick. But it's not always... But, um, you know, it's not always the best thing to constantly be seeing the same dudes all the time. They're kind of kind of milk toasty. Uh, but what truly makes them unique is their capacity for empire building. As I had said before, these dudes control eight solar systems. There are eight solar systems under the, uh, I guess, doctrine of Ultramar. Uh, whereas most chapters only control, like, one planet, these guys have got eight whole solar systems which is where they get most of their numbers from. And they've also striven to actually improve the quality of life on those planets, uh, creating what are effectively utopias in this huge grimdark world where there's nothing but perpetual war and everything sucks, uh, without becoming too soft for the Imperium. I feel like that's probably their greatest strength, because they, when they go to war, they're not just going with Space Marines, they're bringing the full might of Ultramar with it. Yeah. That's, uh, really great. Not to mention, actually, I'm pretty sure they also have the most number of, um, if they're not the only chapter, I think they still have the most number of uh, Primaris Space Marines. For those who don't know, the Primaris Space Marines are basically Space Marines Plus. Uh, they're basically better than Space Marines in every way, except for experience. So, yeah, they're not too important, but I'm pretty sure the Ultramarines have the most number of these guys. Uh, that being said, their over-reliance on the Codex Astartes, which is basically their battle bible, can make them predictable. And, obviously, eight solar systems to protect from outside influences can kind of spread their armies a bit thin. Both of those weaknesses were actually shown during Makar's ultimate invasion of Ultramar, Although the Ultramarines won, uh, it, there were a lot of losses to it. Also, as I'd said, they're generalists, so they don't excel at any particular part of warfare, and are reluctant to evolve their strategies from what's in the Codex Astartes, which can make them very inflexible. Uh, however, some... Ultramarines, like Uriel Ventress, have begun employing more unorthodox strategies, but as a whole, the Ultramarines are quite predictable and inflexible, which can suck for them. Next up, we've got the uh, 18th 
chapter of Space Marines. The 18th chapter, the Salamanders. I feel like these guys are probably one of my favorites. Now, the Salamanders are, uh, well, for starters, they are primarily known, uh, well, their, uh, their color scheme is, or well, it consists of a kind of mild green uh, and a decent amount of black. More black than the Dark Angels do. Now, their green is a lot uh, lighter than the Dark Angels, and they have more black in their armor, uh, which is kind of the main difference. So it's like, it's kind of half green, half black, actually. Uh, they are led by their Primarch, Vulcan, who I believe was always referred to as being the physically biggest and physically strongest Primarch out of all of them. So the thing with Vulcan is that we don't actually know where he is right now. We do know that, like, so here's the thing. He is something known as a Perpetual, which basically means that if he dies, he will just resurrect eventually. So we know for a fact that he isn't going to stay dead. If he is dead, then he will just come back. Uh, but if he isn't, I believe it's said that he has been going about looking for something in the, in the galaxy. Exactly what it is he's looking for, we don't know. But it is a bit weird that he's abandoned his chapter to do this. I feel like they're going to reveal what he was actually looking for, but uh, it's going to take a while, <laughs> and uh, it better be worth it. So, the Salamanders themselves, they are very focused on fire-based weaponry. They're pretty good craftsmen, uh, meaning that their forces will often be self-equipped and more self-reliant than other space marines. Uh, especially when it comes to fire-based weapons. They are quite the pyromaniacs, I will say. Um, they're also probably the most compassionate and the kindest out of all the space marines. Most other space marines just see normal people, your average man, woman, and child, as being like inferior beings to them, which they kind of are, but like you don't need to be such a dick about it. The Salamanders actually see them as people, and we have seen many instances of the Salamanders giving their lives in order to protect the common man, woman, and child. Salamanders also typically have families, and they will frequently go to visit them as well. They kind of bring a bit of light in this grim, dark world. Now, their compassion is probably their greatest strength, and their biggest weakness. They're the ones that truly see themselves as servants of the Imperium, which is uh, quite ironic considering that your average salamander has like charcoal black skin and red eyes, which is gonna look pretty scary. While this does mean that other forces of the Imperium are going to really like the salamanders, this can also lead them to getting manipulated by others more easily than other chapters. The Salamanders also have a little bit of a martyr complex. You remember when I was saying before how they would give their lives to protect your average person? Uh, yeah. They can sometimes completely destroy themselves for what they believe is right. They strive to lay their lives down for the humble citizen, which can lead to some cost of inefficient losses for little gains. Uh, not only that, but they also are a little prone to some uh, impulsiveness and hastiness, preferring to adhere to the teachings of Vulcan, which valued uh, restraint instead. Or, actually, yeah, 
they're a little bit restrained, kind of like Jedi. They're not ones to jump into the fray of things. I know that's the exact opposite of what I just said, but I'm um, sorry. This is also probably a result of the near extinctions of the Legion, both pre-Vulcan and during the Istvan 5 drop site massacre, as well as the need to combat this uh, self-immolating tendencies. Uh, yeah. I really like the salamanders. Sometimes it seems they're a little bit too good for the for this for this uh, cold, cruel world. And then finally, we have one last uh, chapter: the nineteenth Space Marine chapter, the Raven Guard, led by Corvus Corax. Uh, now, the Raven Guard have a very similar color scheme to the Iron Hands, actually. The Raven Guard, what I had said before about the Iron Hands being like kind of black and silver mostly, the Raven Guard are pretty much just black, uh, with only the Imperium symbol on their chest being a very light silver. Uh, they are led by Corvus Corax, who. Uh, he's somewhere out there as well. It seems as though he kind of wants to die. So, so uh, he's missing somewhere. We don't really know exactly where he is, but he's somewhere. And uh, some may say that's good enough for us. Uh, and as you could probably expect from, uh, well, an all-black Space Marine squad, they are masters of stealth absolute masters, which can be kind of funny considering, remember, these dudes are seven feet tall and wear super heavy power armor, so how can these guys be stealthy at all? But the Raven Guard are undetectable even with their power armor. They are masters at guerrilla warfare and have also developed a very independent mindset to the point where they can actually operate on their own behind enemy lines for months or possibly even years at a time, which is uh, an impressive level of independence, especially compared to other space marines. However, this autonomy can backfire, as they often rely less on their allies for support. Sometimes, that can be deployed to a conflict and win it without anyone else even knowing about their presence. Even within their chapter, they can be notoriously independent, considering that uh, I believe they've never actually deployed their whole chapter in a battle ever. They're very much like they'll send in a very small number to operate behind the lines in espionage. Uh, they're also terse and abrasive, um, often because of a genetic curse that is known as the Lure of Shadows. So what is the Lure of Shadows, you may ask? Well, I am glad you asked. So, the Lure of Shadows, as soon as I find the article on it, uh... Lure of Shadows, 40k. Um. Huh? Okay, I don't have any information on it, actually. But, uh, this curse, this genetic curse, can lead to them being terse and abrasive. These, those Raven Guard that suffer from Lure, tend to be very uh, withdrawn, moody, uncooperative, like Batman. <laughs> uh, and they also believe that their preferred method of warfare is like objectively correct and unambiguously superior to the frontal assaults of other chapters. This can be seen as just arrogance by other chapters, and often leads to worse relationships between the Raven Guard and their battle brothers. 
Which is a shame, because when they combine their force uh, with others, they can produce amazing results. Like, seriously, could you imagine, like, a combined assault of Raven Guard and Iron Hands? Or Raven Guard and uh, Space Wolves? Like, they'd be pretty much unstoppable. Yeah. This was actually a case when they hunted Voldorius together with the White Scars. So, it is a shame that they don't tend to work well to get uh, in a group. They don't do teamwork very well. And yeah, that's it. That's all of the... All nine of the first founding Loyalist Space Marine chapters... Now, obviously, there are other successor chapters, which kind of... There's, there's a lot of them. I would say at least, like, I don't know, 30 to 50 of them. A lot. Um, so, I might talk about them at a later point in time. But I reckon for next time, I... Next time I talk about Warhammer, I'll talk about the other forces of the Imperium that uh, are not Space Marines, because obviously Space Marines aren't the only forces that the Imperium has. Which ones do they have though? Well, <laughs> oh, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to find out uh, next week on the next episode of Have a, <gasps> have a Good One. This has been going on for a very long time, so I'm gonna stop it right here. And uh, thank you very much for listening, guys. Have a good one.